And you ready? I have to find it just a moment. I mean, I had it open, but to get it started again at the very beginning, let it load. It wouldn't pause for me. So here we go. This is Roy speaking.
doctor says, if we do, he says, he says, you won't be giving it to him. Well, I says, what's the matter with a great big husky fellow like me? He says, go look in the glass. When I look in the glass, I was quite white, all right. But he says, we're going to just give him an intervenous this time. He says, he'll probably be rational once more. And they, they called Rose then. And she come in. We sat there beside this, with this bed. And pretty soon he began to stir around. And it was when he was spinal angitis. His neck had all swelled up and he'd all rainbowed back. But he almost raised up in that bed. We didn't know at this time that there'd been a boy, a Seventh-day Adventist nurse, put on this case. He was only a young fellow, 20 years old, the age of Jack. We didn't know that he'd been given the, the duties of putting hot and cold compresses on his head. He was the only one that knew how to give that. How do you think of that boy's work? Did you learn that? You Seventh-day Adventists know how they give those treatments. This boy happened to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And when they, the doctors called for these kind of treatments, they said we could put him on the operating table, but he said he'd have to be on there three, three hours and 45 minutes at least, and he couldn't come through the, the operation, I'm sure. Well, I said, doctor, if it's, if it's that bad, I said, don't mutilate his head. I said, leave him whole. He said, that's a good decision, Father. But he said, we want you to know that we're doing everything we can to save this boy's life, but you say so. Well, I said, please leave him whole, then. He can't come that operation. This boy had a long time. Every time he'd come in there, they kept all the other nurses out and shut the doors. And they told him, this head nurse had told him, we found this out in Los Angeles later when we spoke at Los Angeles. He says, that we know you're a Seventh-day Adventist now. And we want you to take your training here with the rest of the nurses. It says, we don't want your religion. If anybody needs spiritual help, we're here to give them that, she said. But he says that didn't stop me. When I come in with my tray and my towels down to work, hot and cold water, he said I carried my little Bible up under the tray where nobody would see it. And they pushed all the nurses out and shut the door. He had about 45 minutes with Jack several times a day. He'd been giving this complete message that we knew nothing about. The Lord sent someone there, folks, to to take care of Jack's needs when his father and mother failed him. We hadn't belonged to any church. He and his mother hadn't belonged to the Presbyterian Church that time in Moscow, Idaho, before we took him up there. I belonged to nothing. We we went in there, and when, when these doctors gave him this intervenous, and they said, they pushed everybody out, they said, now you and the mother stand by here. It said, you'll probably be rational once more. Jack stirred around pretty soon. He almost raised up in that bed. And there's a picture of Christ to put the bed on, on the wall. He put up his hand. He said, Dear Jesus, he said. And he turned hurriedly to his mother and father. And he says, Please, please turn to Christ. He says, Dad, please turn to Christ. I never went to church with him. He's worried about his dad. I said, Yes, darling, I will. He says, Thank you. He said, Now I must kiss you goodbye. Rose reached over and kissed Jack goodbye. I reached over and kissed him. And he, he says, oh, he held up his hand. He said, I must kiss Dad on the face once more, he said. He was worried about his dad. I reached over and kissed him again. And folks, my pride, my joy was gone. Now, life could only went out there. We could only lay it down with him. But we can't do that, folks. We have to go on living. We went on back to the, the farm in Deer Park, Washington sitting in front of the fireplace one night, just after that, trying to pull ourselves together. And uh, I says, now Rose, I says, I'm going to, I want to join a church. I'm going to try to do what Jack told me to do. But she says, just what church you want to join, Roy? Well, I said, I don't know. My folks a lot of them belong to the Christian church. And I said, I do believe what I've heard them argue about, baptism by immersion. I said, I want to be baptized the way Christ was. She said, all right, let's join the Christian church. And she was quite a singer, and she sang in the Christian church the whole time. I said, that'll be fine. Some of my folks in the Pomeroy church over here belong to that, that church. We went down, we, we 
contact the minister, both them. He said, she'll be here tonight. He said, I'll, when we get through singing the sermon, he says, you step out when I give the invitation. When I call for it and uh, walk down the aisle, and he says, I'll greet you and I'll take you around baptize you while it's the audience is singing. We told him, all right, we did. He didn't tell us what the church believed. Of course, we knew that pretty well. But he didn't tell us about what we must do. I must quit my drinking and anything like that that I would do, smoking and so on. He didn't give us any instruction at all how to live. About gambling or card playing or anything like that. But he would go around baptized us. We were very happy. We joined her. We put our names on the books together. Every Sunday we went to church over at the big Christian church on, in Spokane. Drove down that 20 miles to this church. But I, I started studying the Bible. I didn't hardly know how to handle the Bible. I picked it up. Every place I'd read, I'd find something about the commandments of God. I finally asked Rose, I said, what is the commandments of God? She said, well, everybody ought to know those words. She said, you mustn't lie and steal or do any other thing. I said, I know that. Where are they? She said, I don't know where they are, but she says, you keep looking, you'll find them. Later, we found this concordance, and I found them. And she called my attention when I started reading them over to the next page. She said, I've been putting her on the spot of everything. She showed me because she claimed to be a Bible student, and I found everything that seemed to be against what she was telling me. We read down there. This fourth commandment, and well, I said I didn't know before that 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 the seventh day was the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And I said, is Sunday the seventh day? Well, she said, of course not. Look at that calendar up there. She says Sunday's the first day of the week. He says Saturday's the seventh day of the week. Well, I said that don't make sense. She says here the. the that the seventh day of the Sabbath, the Lord thy God. Well, she said, I've heard sermons preached on that. She says there's a scripture that goes something like this. In commemoration of the resurrection of Christ, the seventh day Sabbath was changed to the first day of the week, and now it's called the Lord's Day. Well, we looked up all the first day of the week scriptures, the Lord's Day and all that, the farther we got, the farther it took us away from the Sabbath. So we started asking the ministers then. She did quite a bit of singing for funerals down Spokane. And different denominations had many funerals, sometimes a couple of weeks. And I said, you know so many ministers down in Spokane. I said, call in some of those smart fellas. <coughs> we'll have them show us where the scripture is. That's what we did. And she said when she was a little girl, her mother used to entertain the ministers. She always made a big chicken dinner with all the trimmings. She says, you go out and get the biggest, fattest, nice red chicken we got out there, and we'll make guest minister and his wife a real dinner. I did that. After, after the dinner, we went in front of the fireplace, and uh, sitting there, and I told this minister, I said, we just joined the Christian church. He says, I heard that. He says, we're very happy. He says, I said, there's a scripture we've been looking for, and we can't find it. He, he says, what do you want? He said, I'll find it for you in a minute. He took my Bible. I said, we want that scripture authorizing a change from the, from the seventh day to the first day of the week for the Sabbath. That man looked like he was froze or somebody throwed some ice water on him or something. He just, he just froze right there. He closed up the Bible and, and seemed so dazed for an instant. And I wondered what I said was wrong. He laid over on a little stand table and he looked up over the fireplace and said, Oh my, what a beautiful deer head you have up there. Where did you get a fellow with all those big points on it? And we hunted and fished all the rest of the day. We never did get back to the Sabbath question. After I left, I asked Rose, I said, What did I say? Did I say something wrong? She said, No. But she says, You've been, you got to talk about your hunting and fishing trips. And so did this minister. And I says, He said, You got clear off of the question. She says, I know lots more of she said, I'll ask another one. We did, folks. We asked another one and another one and another one until the chicken house was almost empty. And, and still we got farther away from the Sabbath question. And finally, I said, what's the matter with this fourth commandment? I said, 
ever once give us a different answer than up here. But she says, don't, don't get excited, Roy. She, she's afraid of my Christian experience. Not afraid I was going to quit at all. I says, why don't they at least get together and give the same answer? And she says, I'm going to ask one more. I want to ask the one down who would go to prayer meeting in the little town of Deer Park, Washington, the lady minister. I said, the lady minister? She says, yes, a lady minister. And she said, maybe I can talk to her better. Well, I said, if these educated men can't tell you anything, what did you expect of a lady, I said. And she said, please, Roy. Well, I said, to make you happy. I said, you ask her. She asked this lady up here, and her deaconess had come up with her. And I asked her the same question after another chicken got it in the neck, of course. And she says, she said, she never opened the Bible. She said, Brother Slaybo, she says, you can't find any scripture like that in the Bible. There is no such scripture in the Bible. She says, well, I says, is, is Sunday the seventh day of the week? She says, no. She says, Saturday the seventh day of the week. But she says, you know, that was changed. I says, changed? When was that changed? Oh, she says, around the year 300, between 300 and 400 A.D. Well, I says, who is the instrumental change? Well, she says, she didn't want to talk about it. She knew more about it than she wanted to tell me. She says, I have heard that the Catholic Church had something to about, do about changing that. But she says, don't worry about it. You go down to church on Sunday and come up here and work to a prayer meeting on Wednesday night like I do, like you've been doing, and we'll be all right. After they've gone, Rosa says, now what do you think of that? Well, I says, we're going to find out. I says, how are you going to find out? I says, we're going to... We're going to check over some of these little books that we've got in there. Rose's mother had bought some little books from the Seventh-day Adventist Church in there. At one of their evangelistic efforts in, in Yakima, Washington, she left three little books there. One was Seeing the Truth of God in the Mark Bible and the On the Eve of Arm Armageddon. I got studying those. I says, I says, here it says the Catholics change that. I says, we're going to find out. I said, we'll go down and we'll see a priest. We did. We went to see a priest. First we went to the library. And the little lady took down book after book. She knew what we was hunting for. She says, so many people been in here lately just finding the same thing. She read it to us on several different books. We went to see a priest. And when we talked to this priest, he says, he says, he kind of smiled. He said, I thought you folks were Presbyterians. And I said, she said, no, we're not Presbyterians. When he said, you know, after all, he figured we Protestants. He said, you people are only Catholics after all, all of you Protestants. And he said, you're cheap Catholics. And he kind of smiled. We said, why are we cheap Catholics? Well, he said, don't you take this book for your, your denomination and so on? We said, yes, we do. But he says, you don't. He says, where are you finding here for keeping the first day of the week holy? He says, that was set aside by our church for our church only. But all you Protestants have followed in our steps and take our day of worship with you. You won't have anything to do with any of our other feast days and holy days. He says, you're cheap because you're protesting against that and you won't get you're stealing our Sabbath. Rose says, does all denomination do that? But he says, all but one smaller denomination. Well, she said, who could they be? He says, those blooming Seventh-day Adventists. I guess he'd been having some arguments with them. And she said, uh-oh. He says, what, are you Seventh-day Adventists? She said, we're just brand new. Well, he says, if you're going for this book, he says, good for you. There's the only denomination I know of that's following that book as much as they can. And he said, they have an inspired word, too. He says we had an inspiration word in our denomination too, about the year three or four hundred. I want to say yes, brother, until you change the Sabbath day. But uh, he was telling us too much. I kept my mouth shut. We were very happy then. We were baptized. Went to Elder Nightingale's meeting down in Spokane. He had a big tabernacle built out near the courthouse. That was about 1940. We sat through that meeting. We were baptized. About 165 were baptized in that effort in Spokane. We joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We've been happy ever since.
after after we left up there, we couldn't stand on the ranch anymore. We rented the ranch out and we went south. We'd, go, we'd help with a few little A efforts. We had several baptisms. Opened up a little church up at Elk, Washington. Rose said, let's go out and try and see what we can do by ourselves. I said, okay. We started way down the coast. We got down as far as Gold Beach, Oregon. It was cold winter time. And down there, it was, it was springtime. With a balmy breeze blowing in off of the ocean to mount the Rogue River. Big, big color lilies, some of them eight inches across the bell, was blooming around the houses. Narcissus and all the different flowers are in bloom. She said, It's a beautiful place, let's stop there for a little while. She inquired around. There wasn't any Seventh day Adventist church there, own little place, about 900 or 1,000 people. It was a it was a county seat town also. No railroad in there, of course. Along 101 highway on the coast. She said, we'll stop here and do some work. And we run around, had so much fun in the woods there for a while. And I bought a strip of land up along the highway. A narrow strip of land where it belonged to the state. And divided among some of our elders and doctors and friends in Spokane. And told them they could build them a summer cottage there. A nice view over the ocean. We were running around there, and she said, Roy, we haven't done a thing. And I was said, we must start our work. She said, I'll go down across the way to that. Folks, I see this lady. Her husband goes to work every morning. And a young girl, about 20 years old, looked like 19 or 20, looked like she's a high school student. And so I said, what are you going to say, Rose? She said, don't worry. She said, I'll find something to say. She went down, knocked the door, and this lady let her in. She said she looked around all over. She said, there's a beautiful new Bible laying on the table. And she saw it was a King James Version. And finally, she said, she got around, she says, my, what a beautiful new Bible you have there. She says, that's not that pretty, she says, my husband, Charlie, just got that for me for Christmas. And she says, are you folks Christians? Well, she says, Charlie just joined the Presbyterian Community Church over here. But she said, I never joined any church. I don't know which church I want to join yet. Well, she said, isn't that fine? She said, we're giving Bible studies up to our house. How would you like to come up for Bible studies? That'd just be fine. So they come up that night, and we asked the young girl, Mitch, we called her, she's so small, asked her to come to them. They come up there, and that night, maybe we put up a job on this fellow just a little bit, because Rose had gone to that church. She knew how he'd been baptized, and we had to study on baptism. We had a study for some study helps. Then we turned on the, off the light and showed a film strip on baptism. When they got through this, this man, he turned over to his wife. He says, Esther, he says, I haven't been, been baptized at all. He says, that minister didn't tell me the truth about baptism. He said, I just been kind of dry cleaned, he says. So and that's the kind of work we was doing when this accident happened. I'm going to start right into that, and I'll have to leave out a lot, folks, to get through here. I only have a few minutes left here. We, we've been given these Bible studies, and we started working out there. We didn't know there had been a, a, a jailbreak that morning, or a few days before in, in Gold Beach. And these two young boys had left their home near Chicago and started out on a life of crime. They was going to Los Angeles where they get a lot of easy money. They had, they had uh, machine guns and everything loaded in their car. And it was in a stolen car. They were robbing a, a man store in Gold Beach that morning. And the, early in the morning, and the, the uh, next door was a baker shop. They'd come down early to start his furniture. He looked in there, and through the Venetian blind, they saw what was happening. They called the sheriff. They locked these two boys up. Well, when the sheriff in a few mornings was bringing their breakfast in to them, he told them to get over in the corner in this little steel building where they had them in their jail. And this younger boy, they'd taken all their guns. This younger boy, he was 15 years old, 15 and 19 years old, two brothers. This younger boy, he says, he called the older Burke. He says, Burke, he says, I still got my little gun. He says, they took the clothes off of the older boy. 
he said, didn't they find your little gun? No, he says, they built all over me, and it was down under darn pit. Built that automatic pistol on the rubber band. When he put his hand down, this way, it pulled out his hand. When he pulled his hand up, it slipped back under his armpit. It fell around him, and they didn't take his clothes off, and they never found his little gun. He says, you take this little gun. So Berkeley had the little gun. When the sheriff come in that morning, put their tray over on the table and told him to go over the corner. Berkeley stuck the gun in his back. He says, I stuck him up, he says. He's telling us later. He says, I took his gun his car key. Locked him up in it. They tore up some sheep and made a buck and gag. He said, Sheriff told me later, he says, they sure done a real job. They tied me up, he said, about 30 minutes, kicking loose from us. He says, they got out and I told them, take my car out there and make a getaway. He said, don't shoot me. He said, I have two boys of my own. He said, I feel sorry for you. Take my car and get away. It's full of gas. He says, I only kept about a half a gallon of gas. I know they couldn't get very far in. He said, it always fill up for him without a long trip. He says, they took a load their loot over into my car and started out on the sheriff's car. Well, they got down the highway a ways. And the little boy, he looked out. He said, Bert, he says, there's a sign on the front door here. It says, Curry County Sheriff. He says, that won't do to go through this California checking station down here. Well, he says, he says, we'll, we'll take care of that. It's about 50 miles down to this checking station here. They said, I have to go in California. They couldn't find any other road going over the mountains. So he says, he said, pretty soon, here's a, here's a big new Pontiac coming with two elderly couples. Big new Pontiac. He says, they're a pretty nice looking hack coming there. He says, let's take that. He said, all right. And he says, when they got the place they could turn around this crooked road along the mountains, they pulled in and went up behind this Pontiac, blew the siren on the sheriff's car, pulled him outside the road. And two elderly men, lumbermen from Eugene and their wives, tore them down over in the brush and told them to throw their purses and everything, watch it, and leave them up on the, in the car. And one lady was carrying her purse. They took a shot right over her head through the trees, and she threw her purse back up on the road to them. And they was making themselves pretty tough. They took all this loot, pulled the sheriff's car across right that little narrow highway, pulled the wires on it so nobody could start it, and jumped this Pontiac and started right back through Gold Beach, about seven or eight miles just, just the way where they had escaped. They, Got up in front of the Weimer place, Elder C. E. Weimer, most of you know him. I bought him a piece of ground there too, and his father was down there. And they were down there talking. I'd start out that morning to start the drag saw. Rose didn't go with me that morning. And as I was coming around, I didn't know there'd been a escape from jail or anybody been in jail. So I went around one of those sharp ravines. These boys was coming nowhere. They saw the sheriff out there and his boss. They ducked down the seat, this big car. And the old father Weimer, he says, I take after those boys. He says, they're driving 90 or 100 miles an hour. He says, they're going to kill somebody. He says, the highway department will take care of them. He says, I'm after two boys in my car. He didn't recognize the boys. And about that time, they heard the crash down this little ravine. He couldn't make over about 20 miles an hour one on sharp ravines. So I, that car crashed right into the left side of me. I was thrown up in the, in the corner of the car and fractured my skull clear back here and broke cheekbone, broke both jaw bones. Glass passed through the left eye. It was laid out on the cheek. But they said later when he saw me, he said the eye was out here about four inches laying on the cheek. What was left of it? The doctor was out of town and there was no ambulance there handed. The Navy and Army ambulance were both along there at that time along the coast. They'd watch it with the gaps, you know. So they, the nurse come out there and she gave me a shot of morphine and got me in town. And I was unconscious. And she picked up this left ear that was laying on the ground, brushed the dust off of it, and wrapped it up in the bandage on, on the head and sent me in town with the Navy ambulance. I never did come to. They sent me up to the coast on Sunday morning to this doctor's ranch. He's up there on 
Sunday morning. He's an elderly man, an old male especially. He go up there trying to get some recreation. He quit doctoring and he bought this ranch up there for, for a hideaway. And nobody on the coast he had to get in the harness again going awar. They sent a, a messenger up there to bring him back. He got in there before noon. And they come over and got Rose and took her over there. When she got over to the hospital, they said, you can go in now. The doctor's in there with your husband. She said, why haven't they called me for, before? She said, they didn't want anybody in here left the doctor got here. And this happened about 9 o'clock. I've been there probably till 9.30. She said, when she come in, she says, I was all wrapped up in bandages. And there was my bloody clothes and shoes that they just cut off from me down to the bed, just a mass of a blood heat, she says. And she says, there's an elderly man there. He looked like he had, he had good clothes on, but they looked kind of like work clothes. He's been up to his ranch. She walked over and took a hold of his hand. She says, are you the doctor? He nodded his head, yes, I am. He says, how badly is my husband hurt? He says, very badly, Miss Wilbon. She says, that's not what I want to know. What's his chance for living? Well, he says, you're asking me a very frank question now. She says, I must have a frank answer. We're down here alone. As many things have to be thought of before I pass out. Yes, he says, you should know. He says, I couldn't give him more than one chance out of a million. She says, how do you know? She knows they had not taken x-rays and so on yet. He says, this way, Miss Slayboy, he said, they have a compound fracture of the skull that I've seen on them. The left eye is out. The left ear is torn off. Both jaws are broken. He said, they almost bit his tongue off down here when he sold over the windshield, over the steering wheel. And he says, he says, that in a cerebral brain fluid, he says, it's coming out of both the eye and the ear. And he says, there's no in the world stopping. So later on, they took x-ray pictures and so on. And I have those pictures in my briefcase out in the car. I have so many pictures out there, but I can't show them to a big crowd like this. I'd have to, if there any nurses or doctors here, I'd be very glad to show them. And he says, he says, what do you, he says, do you have any relatives? He says, we have lots of them. He says, you better get them here right now. He says, where are they? She says, some in Spokane, some in Seattle, uh, some in Portland. Oh, he says, don't send for them then. He says, you wouldn't want them to come down here and meet them halfway. She says, it's going to be that quick. He says, what you do, you call up one and then have them call the rest of them. We, she did that. She went out to call and, and uh, so the, the nurse, night nurse was put on that night nurse that night, uh, Mrs. Jenny Snyder. She was a very fine nurse up the river, lived up the river. She had a young married daughter and um, family there. She says, we said we'll call Mrs. Snyder in for, for, for night duty. They called Mrs. Snyder in. She stood on one side of the bed and rose on the other side all night. Night after night, they got up to, to Tuesday night. Mrs. Snyder picked up all her books and everything to take home. The fingernails had got black, black clear up into my hand. The face had swelled up here. This big, my tongue that I'd almost bit off. The food goes straight out of the mouth. Looked like a big piece of raw liver sticking out of there. And they'd been swabbing my road throat all morning and night. And when I quit breathing, it pressed on my chest till I'd catch my breath again. And she says, she says, Miss Slave, well, I'm very, very sorry. She says, I don't let any of my patients work on my but She says, this seems to be different than any case I've ever worked on. And she says, you're going to have a terrible time this morning. And she says, she says, I'll see you again someday, I hope. So she left, took all her reading books that she used during the night and so on home with her. But during the morning, Rosa, there was something passed on the wall. She had a kind of vision or something. Elder not Elder Weimer had told her about James 5, 14, 15. If any sick among you, let them call in the elders of the church and know him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And if he's committed sins, they'll be forgiven him. And she says, 
he didn't understand what he's talking about. Their lamp was flashed on the wall in the dark, and she read those scriptures. And after that, it darkened and come on light again, she says. And the next scripture says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. She says, There's the solution to the whole thing. And she called for Elder Wyman right away. He called for Elder T.O. Thummer in Crescent City. And he says, I'll try and be there by noon if I can. I'll have four of these old bar tires on the car. About 10 minutes to 12, the doctor come in. And he couldn't find any pulse. And he listened to the heart. He couldn't find anything. And he looked at my hands. And he just reached across the bed and patted Rosa on the back and went out and didn't say anything. About that time, cars drove up. Elder Thummer was there. And they, they come in around. My two nephews, my brother, and, and Rose's brother had come. And she wasn't alone. Our elder and sister Wyman was there. They come in and stood around the bed. And these two big nephews of mine, big timber fellows, Elder Thummer was going to lose the knowing. He was the older man. Elder Wyman had asked him to do it. He says, is there anyone in here that doesn't believe in God? If there is, will you please leave? And, and no one left. He says, that will all kneel. I was still unconscious. Rose was holding my hands. The rest of them was all kneeling. She says her faith was, that if the Lord was going to heal me, he'd reach down and take a hold of his hands. She'd stand there beside this high hospital bed holding my hands up. They all prayed. Elder Weimer prayed a beautiful prayer. In my vision, I presume was a dream. In my unconscious, I saw Elder Weimer kneeling at the foot of the bed. And friends, it was the most beautiful, gorgeous thing that I could ever behold. It would have come right in through the wall from nowhere, seven foot tall, a beautiful heavenly being. He was at least seven foot tall. He didn't have long hair, but he had little golden ringlets all over his head, just as golden as his face. Smooth face, slightly Roman nose, deep set blue eyes, the most beautiful thing you could ever behold. White sheen robe on it, hung in place and cleared the floor. And a big golden girdle around the right side, and big tassels hanging on golden tassels. He gave me a very soaring lift. He says they tried to get you out there on the road. But he says, don't worry. He said, I've been sent to raise you up again. With that, he reached over and touched me. I was dumbfounded. I, was, I couldn't ask him who he was or anything. I was just, I was just, and when he touched me, the unconscious left me, and I saw him in reality. And I almost leaped out of bed. The shock was so great. I know what you read now when Daniel says, I fell on the face of one dead when he's having one of these visions. I know what he means. Friends, if you come in contact with a, with a heavenly being, with this sin in our hearts like we have, you'll fall on your face as one dead. I looked about the room. I couldn't look at him. And here I see my brother and his nephews and their wives, and all my loved ones there, and my wife's brother, and tears was coming off all their cheeks. I wondered what's going on here anyway. But my thought was on this little thing, and I thought, if I look again, it'll kill me. I'm going to take one more look, and it'll kill me. I never saw anything like this in my life. I let my eyes steal back through, thought I was going to get another great shock, but he disappeared. He must have known I couldn't take another look and live, folks. And friends, as I've told many people, if this beautiful thing was anything like we'll be when we're changed in the twinkling of an eye, it says that the last trump. Heaven's going to be cheap with anything you have to pay for it. Let's be faithful to the end. We were in there just a few days. And after I came to, I told Rose, I said, well, when we go to home, I says, I says, go get the car and we'll go home. She hadn't told him anything about the car. My car was kind of a mess. And she says, she said, oh, we're going to be here a long time. The doctor said, if you get well, you're going to be here at least three to five months. And, well, I said, you can stay if you want to, but I said, I'm gone. I've got work to do. I'm going home. I didn't feel a thing. I worked all right. And she says, well, you can't go home till I dismiss you. 
Well, I said, that better dismiss me. And I, I complained for a couple of days. And one day I says, the doctor was coming in, and I says, now Rose, I says, that doctor better dismiss me today. I says, this is just a little town here. And I says, if you don't get me some clothes to go home, I says, I'm going down the street here without any clothes. I'm going to give them something to talk about in this little town. And, and she said, well, he'll be here this morning. When he went out, she followed him out. She said, doctor, you better dismiss this case of yours. He says, he's going home clothes or no clothes. He says, he means just exactly what he says. Well, he says, take him home. I don't know what, what's happened here, but he says, not a thing the matter with him right now. The head nurse there, she says, doctor, you don't mean that. She says, she says with what he's been, it'll take him two weeks to learn to walk. And, and I said, I said, I can walk. He said, put some slippers on these bathrobes. Let's see if we can walk. Okay. And the one coming behind me in the wheelchair to pick me up, the head nurse says, you get on that side, Mr. Slavo, of course, when his feet hit the floor, he'll go down the heap. I saw what they was doing, all ready to grab me. And I pushed them all out of the way, and I started right down the corridor. That's the way they coming behind me in the wheelchair. She says, I didn't know I'd never been in that place before. I went down there, and I turned the first room to the right. It was open. I went into the nurse's dining room. The nurse pushed her chair on me. She said, sit down here, Roy, and have Dinner without us today. They're just sitting down for their noon meal. I sat down there and I think I ate everything on the table and would have more if I could have got a hold of it. I was so hungry I hadn't had anything to eat. So after I got through eating, I looked back down the hall. I was going back to try to get some coat. She said, Roy, you go in here and sit on the coat on the, our couch. She says, half of the town here and all these army captains and so on want to come in here. They want to see the man that was healed with prayer. I said, all right. I sat there and had visitors all afternoon. That night we had a regular jubilee around there. All our friends and relatives come in. And so the next day, Rose, I said, go get the car. And she says, she said, oh, Roy, our poor car. She said, it won't run anymore. So well, I said, I said oh, we'll get a taxi. She called across there. There's a fellow, this Charlie Donica, the fellow that said he had a, dry cleaning on his baptism. He was right across there at the service station. He says, Charlie, do you want to take us home? He said, just as soon as I fill this car with gas. He drove over there and, and took us home. We walked out together and went home. That afternoon went down to the seashore. She said, you can't go down there at the mouth of the river now. That's a mile away. I said, I never felt better in my life. We went down there and had a prayer meeting that night. And the sun went down over the ocean. Thank God for all his kindness, mercy, and love. We have worked hard then with this here. We call for help. There's so many people come into our home for Bible studies. We call for C.A. Scriven, who was the president of Oregon Conference at that time. He sent Elder H.D. Scriven and Walter Blam, who was later, he was interned under Elder Scriven, later become our Oregon Conference president. He sent them down to put on Necker to Gold Beach. We raised up a little church. I was down there just recently, and, and they, they had that church all dedicated just recently. Maybe some of you saw the pictures of it in the, in the cleaner. But anyway, this nurse, night nurse, she come back that night. She said, she said Rose, she says, do you have any of your literature? She said, I'd like to read some of your literature. And she come back. She, they had to go out, send the car out to bring her in. She says she, she says I didn't bring. I took all my books home. I don't have anything to read tonight. And she saw I was normal. She says what's happened here today when everybody left? She says when I left this morning, Roy's dying, been dying all night. They've been pumping mucus out of my throat so I could breathe, pushing on my chest, giving me artificial respiration. But she said, when I come back, he's perfectly normal. He knows everybody, and swelling's all gone down. The black and blue left his face. And she says, she says, I want to know what happened. Well, she says, you know, we're Seventh-day Adventists. She says, I know that, but she says, what's that got to do with this? She says, we followed the instructions, James 5, 14, 15, you can read it. She says, and he had immediate healing. She says, do you have any of your literature? I'd like to read some. 
Well, she said, I don't have a lot. I have lots over at the house. But she said, I'd like to have something to read tonight. Rose said, let me look in my purse. She had one of these great big sacks of purses she always carried. And it was always full. I, I, I called it full of junk. And, and she was to get quite a kick out of that. We was going down to Los Angeles one day. And, and she says, she said, I can't find the car keys in here. And so I said, Rose, why don't you take that over to the curb and dump it and start a new collection? And she says, that, that's sure a, a, a kick against the lady's purse now, isn't it, she said. And so, but anyway, she looked down in this big purse. And when she'd taken some of the folks over to the house, she said there was a little paper blew out in the middle of the room. Now when she opened the door. And she said, I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't want in the ways, I just stuck it in my purse. And she said, let me look in my purse. She looked in there, and there was a little present truth in there. And she says, here's one of our little church papers, a little present truth, we call it. And she says, uh, she said, Miss Snyder, she said, I watched her all night. She says, she must have read that seven or eight or ten times, clear through, word for word. In the morning, she says, can I have this little paper? She says, certainly. She says, where can I get about 10 or 12 more copies? And uh, she says, you want them all like that? She says, just like this one. My folks don't know anything about this. But she says, let me see what I gave you. What do you think that was the first Seventh-day Adventist literature she's ever read? It says the seal of God or the mark of the beast. And she wanted 10 or 12 more copies. This, this nurse was baptized with this little girl, Donica girl, and several others were raised up at church in Gold Beach anyway. Family over there will go through there. They have a nice cement block church there, and right off to the main drive through there. And if you happen to go in there, you'll notice over to the right there, Rose Claymore died in 1953. I put in a nicest drinking fountain I could get in Portland. They put the over near the wall, the plaque on the wall. It says, in memory of Rose Label, who is she speaking all through the United States in different conferences, camp meetings. She says, anyone that wants to donate a brick or a board to our to go Beach Church, she says, send it to the secretary and give them her, she says, the treasurer, give them her name. And there's lots of money coming from all through the United States to help build that go Beach Church. They only have about 50 members there, but they have a church. Uh, with auditorium half as big as this one, I guess. Okay. Um, that's just, maybe there's five seconds more on that particular section, but there's another section that uh, we can play next time, if you wish. I don't know what the next section that Roy is um, talking about. I don't know what it is, but we can um, certainly pick up where we left off. Okay, well, let's close with prayer, shall we?